are at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum for our third Saturday on February 16th, 2013. And we have a program of um, lots of history in, for you today. Um, our theme is calamities, wind, water, fire, um, and your and human error um, and so we will you'll be able to see lots of information on all of that we start out with um, the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century we have a number of um, different episodes that happened during um, that time and then you will move on to um, the sinking of the Phoenix and we have lots of information about the people who were involved in that we also are very very lucky to have um, an author who has written um, a book called The Shadow of the Phoenix that was published in 2011. Um, then we have a number of videos on the fires that we had in the Sheboygan area. We have two um, former firefighters, one a um, fireman chief, who are here to help you learn about those. Um, and then um, we also have some information on the I-43 um, car crash that involved um, many, many um, people from the area and involved a number of deaths. Uh, then we also go into um, some of the fires, um, the major fires in the county, um, the Waldo Mill fire um, we have information on and we have a um, person who actually helped um, catch one of the um, victims from um, that were able to be saved from that fire and then we also have information on the Globe Lanes fire that was um, in Random Lake. Um, then we also had a major major tornado that was in our county that we are covering information on and um, then we have a number of um, snowstorms, major snowstorms that we had through the years. So um, we have lots for you to see. We had lots of help with resource people who gave us information on this. So I hope that you enjoy the day. Hi, I'm Mary Jane Gruitt and I'm delighted to be here today to talk to you about the Phoenix. The Phoenix, as you know, is this ship that was bringing Dutch immigrants to Sheboygan County and it had stopped overnight in Manitowoc because of a bad storm. Manitowoc is a better harbor than Sheboygan, at least it did at that time. And um, it stopped there overnight and stayed in the, uh, in the harbor. And about one o'clock in the morning, after the seas had calmed down, the captain gave orders for the boat to be, uh, to start heading for Sheboygan. And about three o'clock in the morning, there were some uh, people who, some men, one who was an Irish engineer, and he uh, smelled smoke, a kind of different kind of smoke than they uh, was they, that they were used to, because of course this was a wood burning boat, and they loaded up a lot of cordwood right there in Manitowoc. So um, they went to the they went to the boiler room and spoke to the people there, but they didn't pay much attention to them. And so the fire just got worse and worse and worse until you can see on this picture, you can see the lifeboats down here. You can see one here and here, and you can also see the fire actually was in the middle of the ship. People would, um, were crowding to the front of the ship and also to the back of the ship and um, getting as far away from the fire as possible. Um, but the fire, actually the boat burned to the hull, it burned to the water line and um, two lifeboats got to shore. There possibly were three, but one was possibly capsized while loading and so those people did not uh, make it to shore as well. Um, after after um, they noticed in Sheboygan that the, that the fire, they could see the fire from, from Sheboygan and they wanted to send people, send boats to uh, rescue them. 
um, they sent a um, one schooner, a wind, uh, sails. And there was not much wind that morning, just a light wind. So it took them a long time to get there. The Delaware was a boat that ran on steam as well, and it needed to get the steam up. So even though they knew about this at 4 o'clock in the morning, the Delaware didn't get there till 7. And about the same time, that's when the other uh, schooner, the wind sailing ship, got there, as well as one of the rowboats at that time came back to the Phoenix as well. And there were three survivors hanging on the bottom of the ship, somehow hanging onto the chains, etc., at the bottom of the ship, and they were rescued and taken along to Sheboygan. Meanwhile, the people that had been in the lifeboats, um, they went, they, some of them walked to Sheboygan, and uh, the captain got a ride because he had been injured on the boat, he had slipped on icy boat in um, in Ohio and had injured his knee and I believe it got infected and he was unable to walk so he was confined to his cabin for the whole time basically the whole time of the journey and um, um, do you have any questions about that? that anything? How many people survived? The number I've read the number as far as 200, 250, how many people survived? Sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking of how many were on the boat. How many were on the boat first? Yes, probably as high as 300. I think it's probably around 250, that's, that's my, my how, number. How many sur survived? 46, 46. Those three that were hanging at the bottom of the ship and the, the lifeboats, and that is all. And the captain was one of the survivors. He was. He got into the first lifeboat. He was possibly just, you know, this is best for you. Just you can't help anyway. Just go ahead, kind of thing, because of the injury. Yes, and I think that's why he got into the lifeboat and got to shore first. And he actually, um, I would say, probably hired somebody to take him to to Sheboygan, since he was, you know, a wagon, something like that. That could be so. so where, where the lifeboats land? The lifeboats landed very close to Whistling Straits, oh. Haven, the little town of Haven, where Whistling Straits Golf Course now now is. And what did the survivors do after they arrived at Sheboygan? Well, they looked for their families. Those that were surviving looked for the rest, the rest of their families, hopefully, who were rescued on that ship, but there was no one except the three people that were hanging at the bottom of the ship. One was a passenger, a Mr. Long, who had um, family, I believe, in Milwaukee, um, and two of the crew members. They were familiar with, you know, what the ship was like and were able to... <laughs> it's 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 pretty scary, but we have we have information in um, the smaller book of the sesquicentennial. Mary Lou, can you pick that up over there? That one, that one, that one. Mm -hmm. Yes, these are family stories about what happened. And uh, there's, there are also things that were written down by various people, newscape, newspaper clippings and things like that, that, were, that they uh, found the stories from. And um, so you can find that in this book. This is a really good, very good resource. Thank you. After. Eighteen forty seven. Spring or summer? November twenty first, eighteen forty seven. Yes. Terrible time to be out on Lake Michigan, especially when there's a nor'easter.
Right now we're looking at one of the Bibles, of, well, I'm sorry, the only Bible that we know of that was rescued from the Phoenix. We think that it had to have gotten into the lifeboat with the family that, uh, that owned it. There was a mom and a dad and four siblings did not survive. The mom, dad, and the four siblings, four siblings did not survive, but four girls did. Their four, four of their daughters did. And they brought this, got this Bible to shore. And uh, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that people were leaving from Holland was because of the um, situation, the religious situation. There was pers some persecution going on by neighbors, a little bit by officials of the government. But um, so religious um, things and Christianity were very important to these people. And uh, you can see what a huge Bible it is. And um, it's a real treasure, a real treasure. It was donated then by this Landaweird family to the uh, research center in 1963. Many of these people who were on the Phoenix came to settle in the Gibbsville and Oostburg and this, that, this area of Sheboygan County. Um, the lady over there knows a lot more about all of the immigrants and where they lived and that kind of a thing. I did not grow up in Sheboygan County and I uh, am not a person who um, can claim that I was a, I'm a descendant of survivors. But I just got interested in it. In fact, could you bring, could you bring that pap muzzle, puzzle thing? That's right. The big thing right here in this end. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is really gonna be, you're gonna have to edit this a lot. How did I first get interested in the Phoenix? You, this is so interesting. We have a tradition of buying a jigsaw puzzle for Christmas in our family. And what happened was that I bought this one that year and we put it together. And over here, right here above Sheboygan, it says 200 Dutch immigrants lost offshore 1847. And we thought, I've never heard of that before. I was raised in Wisconsin schools. I have no idea. I've never heard of that. And well, time went on. A couple of years later, my husband got a new employment, or got new employment in Sheboygan. And we moved to Sheboygan County, so we're right in the heart of Phoenix information and Phoenix history. So that's how I got interested. And I got interested in enough to do a lot of research about it and ended up writing this book, Shadow of the Phoenix. It starts in Holland, but it's the story of one boy who, with his family, comes to America. He is on the Phoenix with his family. Now, the boy himself is fictitious. He and his family are fictitious. And um, I have him... Um, his family all are, do not survive except for he and his little brother. And then the rest, of the, the rest of the story takes place in Sheboygan County, how he goes around. He's trying to find work because he needs work in order to get back to Holland. He wants to go back to Holland because that's where it was safe, comfortable, and so he goes around to different places in Sheboygan County. He's in uh, Amsterdam Beach. He's at Oostburg, East Oostburg, and also at the Wade House. So there's a lot of history in Sheboygan County history in the book as well. So thank you. My name is Mary Lou Dumay, and I um, do a, a lot of volunteer work at the Oostburg Historical Society. 
Um, I am a survivor, or my ancestors were survivors of the Phoenix. There were 24 Dutch survivors, and out of those 24, three of them were my ancestors, and I can point the families out for you. Um, these were my father's grandparents, the Wilterdings, and Mr. Wilterdings' wife and five children, I think, drowned. But Mr. Wilterdink was in a lifeboat. He was the, one of the people that had an oar that was trying to get it to land. And this lady was the maid. She came with the Wilterdink family, and she was in a different lifeboat. And through some misunderstanding, only these two survived, and they didn't know they, they were each on a different lifeboat. Um, later on, he married the maid, and they um, had a large family of children. Um, then also, over here is my mother's grandfather. He was also a survivor. I don't think any he came with any family, so um, he just came alone and he happened to be one of the survivors also. They both lived in the Gibbsville area. Most of the survivors went to either Gibbsville or Cedar Grove because they had family members that were living there. Um, <clears throat> this board is of some of the other families of survivors. <clears throat> Ione Heinen was very instrumental in writing these stories up. She and I worked together on some of these things. Um, this woman here, Mrs. Ong Pietenpol, was also a survivor, and that's why Ione was interested in it. You know why did he came to the United States? Um, my family, the family story says most of them came for economic reasons. Um, they ha also suffered somewhat from the potato famine, and they wanted, they came with large families, many of them, and they wanted more opportunity for their children because there was more land here. They came with quite a bit of money to buy land in the area and I don't know what happened to the money. I think it's maybe at the bottom of Lake Michigan for all I know. Um, that was their main reason although they did value religious freedom too but I don't think they were part of the secession group that um, came for totally religious reasons. This is a model of a little ship that Mr. Louis Rousseau made. Um, Mary Rousseau was very instrumental, along with Eileen Heinen, in writing the materials of the family, about the families who survived. And her father made this little model of the ship. This little book was the first book written about the Phoenix. And up on the top there are the pictures of the people who wrote this little book in 19, or eight, 1987, I think. So. These two volumes were written by Mary Rousseau and Ione Heinen. The first volume tells all the different family stories. There were many stories. Each family had their own story and um, very interesting. Then the second volume has all the genealogies of all the different families that were survivors the 24 family. I think the number of people, 
I don't know how many people that involves today, but um, they were they were survivors. I'm Jack Johnson, resident of Waldo. I was involved in rescuing the wife and children of the the men's fire in where the Mill, Millburn town. And my son and I, which was Ted Johnson and Officer Cram from the Sheriff's Department, we she threw the little guy out of this third story window. He's five years old. And uh, then she came out and I literally kept caught her in my arms. She would probably weigh about a hundred pounds. She was just a little the two other boys they ducked back into the into the building, they wouldn't jump out, so we couldn't save them. Uh, we lived on the, I, I believe the doors were nailed shut because I tried to get in the doors and it could, they didn't move. You know, I, I'm not just a little fellow. And uh, believe it or not, I was outside the building the whole time and I got taken in for smoke inhalation. So I wound up in a in the hospital also and uh, it, w it was quite a lengthy investigation they did a lot of digging and stuff in the back they're looking for other evidence for other things that you could possibly be involved with I don't know uh, how did the fire so start? how did the fire start? they believe it was uh, arson in the back in the back end of the building there it was on the, on the south side, that's where the fire escapes were, and the exit for the house. But he was, uh, uh, there, there was several things going on there that nobody knew about, and, you know, with sexual things and stuff, you know. And, no, I'm not. My son was. No, I live next door. I looked out the window. My my coon hounds were barking. I looked out the window and uh, and there, there the building was. There was my son hollered. There was a, there's a fire next door. And the fire was coming out under the eaves of the building already. So. Any other questions or? It was, it started at four o'clock in the morning on uh, September 17, 1989. October 16, 1983, the Prangy Fire at downtown uh, Sheboygan. I was off duty at the time, however, I was called in to active duty. And when I arrived at the scene, approximately 6 p.m., the entire building was completely involved in flames. It was now uh, our position to protect the exposures. We couldn't prevent the building from burning down, but we just protected the exposures. And we spent the entire day and night there. It was a sus suspected arson, however, to my knowledge, it has never been proven to be an arson. We couldn't, fi couldn't find a victim or couldn't find a anyone that was responsible for it. Uh, also, as far as I know, there was no injuries to the, any of the firefighters, to any of the residents, other than just minor injuries. Not, nothing uh, very devastating. It uh, was, the time was working on it. Prior to that fire, I did talk to uh, Tom Betine, who was De the demolition uh, contractor, and I did advise that he keep his trucks as far away from the, vi uh, the building as possible for gasoline and diesel possibility of fires with those. And that was a good thing also, that that would have created a lot of uh, extended fire had he had his trucks closer. So, the, it was a big loss to the city, a big department store that was 
later on rebuilt by uh, Frangies and then sold to another uh, company. Good morning, uh, my name is Larry Schneider. I'm a retired firefighter from the city of Sheboygan. I had 31 years in the Sheboygan Fire Department and uh, um, I had gotten a call about two weeks or three weeks ago from Joanne Gedeke indicating they were going to have a program out here today in regards to history and, and fires and other calamities that happened in the city and county of Sheboygan. Um, I was asked by Joanne to put together whatever information I might have that would show some of the fires, some of the rescues, and some of the things that the fire department has been up against in the years that I was in the department, and some of the clippings even date back further than that. Um, as you might see here, probably one of the biggest and largest fires that I was at was the Thonay fire. And uh, we have pictures and they're on the boards and we've got a specific booklet here that also shows just the beginning parts of the fire. And eventually there was an explosion in that building that took out a lot of the main water pipes in there. So there was no sprinkler system that helped us fight that, that fire and you can see that it was very ferocious and early in the day it was probably oh and if i want to guess to say the 50 degree temperature and by later on in the day the wind had shifted out of the northeast and we had actually I had snow flurries and it didn't help us fight the fire because it pushed the fire from one side of the building to the other side of the building uh, eventually the building was torn down. It was located on, a, on ele North 11th Street, uh, approximately where the old very fine dairy was off of Water Street. Um, we've got many pictures here that show pictures of rescues, which is something the fire department does almost daily, and that is uh, car accidents where people are trapped inside the vehicle where they need extrication tools to get the people out, whether they need to take roofs off, doors off, push up steering wheels and so forth just to extricate the people from the vehicle. A um, couple of the, the posters and they came from clippings that uh, Joanne put together that I had in my scrapbooks is, here's a picture of myself and this happened many years ago which was an early morning house fire and I always liked that picture because I look a lot younger in there. But it was a small house fire in the morning. Fortunately, the mother and the two children were able to get out before the fire got too far along. Uh, the firefighters arrived on scene. We put the fire out in a very short period of time. But we did find a pet, a dog in there, uh, who was rescued, brought out, was not breathing at the time. And believe it or not, one of our firefighters gave that pet mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitation and, and brought the dog back to life again. So very proud of that. Um, we have boat fires that happened on the river, and I was at that fire there, which um, eventually later brought the Sheboygan Fire Department into owning their own fire boat. Uh, we cooperated very well with the Coast Guard, but in a lot of cases now, being on the lake as Sheboygan is, um, we sometimes need to get out into the water, whether it's a rescue for somebody that's ill or sick on another boat, or if there are any types of fires or people in the water that are possibly drowning. So the fire department now has their own rescue boat that is stationed down during the summer months down at the Harbor Center down there so that they can get into it and be out and try and do whatever they need to do in a very short period of time. Uh, another rescue that's up on the board up here is the shop coincidence for when they were building the Shopco building, the department store, uh, one of the walls collapsed during heavy winds while the construction workers were working on that building. Um, I, if I'm correct, one person had died on scene. There were about seven or eight various people that were um, injured in the actual incident with one man dying and I believe later on another person passed away because of the injuries he received at that fire. Um, I could go on and on here. Uh, I just want to say that I'm very grateful and thankful that Joanne called me because it's refreshed my memories. And if we can keep this stuff alive and let people know what, you know, some of the problems we had in the city of Sheboygan, 
Um, maybe we, some way we can find ways to prevent them from happening in the future. Um, one of my jobs when I was in the fire department was um, going out and doing safety talks and I know I had a, a fire death in a, ho in a house fire on, um, it was Geely Avenue and I always used the pictures from the investigation at that fire because what had happened at that fire was the people, the residents, the husband and wife that lived there took their smoke detector off the wall because it was located very close to a bathroom and every time they would take a shower or a bath the smoke detector would go off because of the humidity. Well they had the smoke detector off and there was a cooking stove fire while the lady was resting in bed and she was never able to get out of the house. So what I have is a picture of a, it looks like the moon with everything black behind it and that's actually where the, the white wall is where they took the smoke detector off um, with no batteries in it and that part of the wall did not get scorched or burned and that's how I started out my presentation. So the point is if you really need to have smoke detectors and you need to keep them operating in your home, uh, we never once, to my knowledge, while I was in the fire department, had a fire death in a home where it had actual working smoke detectors. We had fire deaths in the city, but in most cases, in all other cases, I should say, the smoke detectors were either not functioning properly or the batteries were removed. And so we ask for your safety to always keep your smoke detectors operating and uh, hopefully, you know, we'll save lives by doing that. Uh, hello, my name is Ed Karsted. Uh, I was employed by the highway department for 38 years and today the Historical Society has a little presentation here set up on some of the snow equipment that was in Sheboygan County and, and some of the snowstorms and also the ice storms uh, of like 1976. Uh, we have a little literature and a lot of pictures that uh, the, came from a book that the highway department had uh, of accumulated pictures from over the years and the snowstorms that we had, uh, plowing snow, and also uh, some of the ice storm and uh, all the damage that was caused by that. A lot of people can uh, reminisce and, and say, on, well, and this year I was here, and uh, they can really relate to a lot of the, the items that are shown here. Uh, we also have some at, at this table of uh, tornado that went through Howard's Grove in 1974. Uh, Some of the pictures here are, are from 1971 and uh, snowstorm in, that went through the area and how it really uh, immobilizes everybody around and catches you by surprise. Even though the weatherman should <laughs> give you a warning, it doesn't always work that way. have some articles about uh, in some trade magazines that were written about snow plowing in Sheboygan County and uh, some of the Oshkosh trucks that they've had and uh, FWDs. Uh, we have some pictures of the snowblower that is currently used at the airport uh, that they re, uh, obtained from uh, the Naval uh, Air Force or, uh, I think an Air Force base in Dayton, Ohio that is uh, currently being used at the airport. Charlie Schwinn from Sheboygan. I lived in Howard Grove 75 years and met my wife. She came from Ada and we, this is kind of a passion of ours doing scrapbooking. And there's a lot of pictures here of fires, ice storms, tornadoes, and some of this goes back a long way, but like I said, that genealogy without pictures doesn't really mean anything. So if you've got pictures, you can relate better to 
what the story is all about. That basically is why we do that. Weddings, wedding anniversaries, funerals, and lots of disasters. Like here's a picture of snowstorm in Sheboygan, 15 inches, 19th of March, 1971. That late in the year, 15 inches of snow. Hello, I'm Steve Sharp, a retired deputy chief from the Sheboygan Fire Department. And it was in August of 1998, the Sheboygan flood, which is our topic today. Uh, I came on duty that morning and you could tell already as you came to work that it was going to be a special day. There was water running in the streets and many of the people that have visited with me today have said the same thing. Um, we received 10 inches of rain that day in a little over six hours. And it was about midway through the morning after already being on a number of calls that we got a report about the Dr. Wick residence on North 8th Street being flooded. And actually the report was that it was moving off of the foundation. Uh, we responded, myself and a police officer. Our other fire units were committed at the time. And he was in the house and the most stable part of the house seemed to be the garage area. And we motioned to him to go to the garage. Um, shortly after he was in the garage, the garage floor collapsed because this large amount of water that had been rushing against the foundation was chewing away at that foundation. And uh, we had to get a rope and get it fast. And the fire engines had committed their equipment. We did get one engine company there, but they didn't have any ropes left. So we got a water ski tow rope from a neighbor's garage and we threw that to him and it kept getting taken down by the rushing water vortex. So we uh, were wondering, what do we do next? We needed to do something fast. We couldn't go in the water ourselves due to the great force of the water. And a plastic jug from Prestone Antifreeze came floating past and I grabbed that, tied it to the rope and we were able to float that rope right to him and pulled him to safety. Uh, shortly after we got him out of the water, the entire garage collapsed. So it was within seconds of that happening that we actually grabbed him and had him back up on dry land. Uh, shortly after that, in fact, it was within five minutes after I left that scene, we got a call about the cemetery building being on fire at the Calvary Cemetery, which is right across the street from, from his residence. That's this photo here, where the, the main building in the cemetery had been struck by lightning and was burning. Uh, I couldn't believe it when we first got the call because it, everything was so wet and the last thing you would have expected that day was to have a house fire and or any kind of a structure fire. And sure enough, it was burning and it was burning well and the firefighters fighting that fire actually were wading in water waist deep and holding on to hoses. The caretaker of the cemetery was there and the one thing that he pointed out to us was that they had their records there from the cemetery, all the burial records and the plots and it was important that those records were saved and he showed us which part of the building they were in so we were able to prevent the fire from spreading into that area and actually we didn't want to put too much water on that area either because he didn't want to soak those records so that that came to a successful outcome um, also I know that in the Sheboygan area that that day there were about 125 homes that had their foundations cave in uh, the Dr. Wick rescue and this fire, that was late morning, probably between 10 a.m. and noon that that happened. And as I remember, by by the middle of the afternoon, things had settled down and then it was just a lot of helping people with pumping out basements and, and whatever. And uh, I, look at, I look at the past and it brings back memories. 
And a couple months ago when the Hurricane Sandy thing was in New York and New Jersey, it reminded me about our Sheboygan flood. And the one thing that we were, we were fortunate about that day is that it was in August and the weather was warm. I think about the people in New York and New Jersey where after that hit, then the temperature was about 35 degrees. And I can't imagine the rescuers or the people a aftermath that you're there, no power in your homes, no heat, no running water, and now the temperature is at or near freezing. That would, that would be a brutal, brutal existence for a period of time before things, uh, things could uh, get back to normal. So it's a day, August 6, 1998, is a day in Sheboygan history that I'll never, I'll never forget, and I can tell by the comments made to me today by people who have stopped at our, our booth over there about the Dr. Wick rescue, a lot of people We'll remember that uh, that day for a long time. Uh, so this is going to cover uh, calamities in Sheboygan in particular, and we're looking at really the early part of the 20th century. Uh, this was actually originally created by Bill Wongaman. He isn't able to be here today. He isn't feeling well, so he entrusted me with it. Uh, my name's Tamara. I'm the collections coordinator here at the museum. Um, so I'm cuter than Bill, but I may not be quite as entertaining, so just bear with me. Um, we are going to start right at the turn of the century uh, when a tornado came through uh, Sheboygan here, August 20th of 1900. And you can see from this map, which is a modern map, but the tornado came in right about at 17th and Indiana, and it moved kind of in a southeasterly direction. Uh, a lot of very typical damage, a lot of roofs ripped off. You can see that there were a lot of uh, windows knocked out and things like that as well. Additionally, there were some buildings that were destroyed. You can see here we have a roof on the left and a roof on the right as well. And as it continued on, one of the next places that it hit was right around 12th and Georgia where it took off the entire steeple of Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Um, now you can see on the left part of the picture here, there's some damage to the house next door and there's some debris laying between the church and the home. But you'll notice that the steeple is nowhere to be found in the picture. Uh, that's because the steeple was found three blocks away from the church. Um, it continued on and really got quite close to the lake. So that, that whole myth that we don't have tornadoes uh, because we're, cl we're on the lake here in Sheboygan is really not true. They do happen and they can get very close to the lake. At 8th and Clara, it actually did a fair amount of damage to the trolley barn uh, for the trolley cars for Sheboygan. And if you look kind of in the center of the picture, you can see the damage to the building, but you can see it picked up some of the trolleys and just tossed them about as well. Ultimately, it kind of curves back around. Uh, it comes out and then it kind of takes this curve back up and ends up hitting Longfellow School, which because this happened in August, it was really good. The kids weren't in school yet. Um, yeah, there was damage, but nobody was hurt within the school. And actually, nobody was killed in this tornado either. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case for the next one we're going to see, which is the trolley accident that happens in February of 1911. Uh, February 9th, 1911. The trolley at that time traveled over the 8th Street Bridge. So you can see that's the 8th Street Bridge now. On the lower right, we have the 8th Street Bridge as well. Now that's actually even a er, uh, later version than the one that this accident happened on. The one that the accident happened on did have kind of a center girder. You can kind of see something right back here in the middle. And the bridge at that point in time, rather than lifting up, actually pivoted in the center and it would turn so it would be parallel to the Sheboygan River. Um, and of course that's for boats to pass by and there was a boat that needed to pass through and so they opened up the bridge for the boat to pass by. 
Well, unfortunately, at that same point in time, there was a car coming down, a trolley car coming down. Uh, George Teamy was the motorman, and he could see that he was going to have to start, stop the trolley. He's traveling south on 8th Street, and so he goes through the stages of stopping the trolley car. The first thing is, apply the brakes. That doesn't work. He's still going too fast. Then he drops sand. He starts dropping sand in front of the wheels, which he could trigger uh, from inside the trolley. That doesn't slow them down enough. Finally, his last step is to actually throw the motors into reverse. And unfortunately, that is still not enough. And the trolley car goes off the bridge into the Sheboygan River with seven people on board. They have the conductor and the motorman and five passengers. All three of the women that were passengers die in this accident. Um, they were, uh, the two older ladies were teachers. They were from Sheboygan Falls. The younger lady, Olga, was from Sheboygan. Uh, they are said to have essentially frozen. They knew they, knew they weren't going to stop. Uh, the, the motorman, the conductor, everybody on board, and they started yelling, you know, you've got to jump, you've got to jump, you've got to get out of the car. And they just, the story goes that they froze. Injured in the accident were the two personnel, uh, the motorman and Mr. Weber, the conductor, along with uh, a salesman, a traveling salesman from Milwaukee. Now there was a fifth gentleman and he was able to escape without injury. Now this is another photo when they were bringing that uh, car up out of the water and you can see behind it the tug. Uh, boat behind it and that's actually the tugboat that had been passing through when they had opened the uh, opened the bridge uh, for them to go through. Now interestingly enough there were actually two trials that occurred with this accident. One was for um, the Sheboygan Light Power and Railway Company. The other was actually for the motorman. George Themey was charged with four uh, with fourth degree manslaughter in this accident. Um, ultimately he was uh, found not guilty, um, but it was a long and it was a pretty heated trial. Our next tragedy, our next calamity that occurs is in August of 1930. August 19th, 1930, Sheboygan is host to the American Legion State Convention and they throw a gala parade. It was, it was the parade of all parades and you can see the people lined up and there were bands and there were hundreds of people in the parade. And you can even see if you look up in the windows, you can see the people in the windows looking on. And so viewing the parade became an issue, finding somewhere for everybody to be that they could see. Now in 1930, this is actually a picture from 1950, but in 1930, the Rex Theater, which is on the left of the screen, was a was, a, was the Fox Theater. And they had a very similar canopy out front. And so they decided to allow people to go out onto the canopy to watch the parade. 40 or 50 people later, the canopy collapsed. It just, it wasn't designed to hold that kind of weight. And it certainly wasn't designed to hold that kind of weight out at the front edge where everybody wanted to stand so they could see the parade. Um, now, unfortunately, oop, not only were people thrown off of the canopy, but there were some people that were trapped underneath because, of course, there were people standing underneath the canopy when it came down. Um, so ultimately, this was, this was kind of the end of the parade at that point. Uh, right about that same time, Governor Kohler was passing by, and he actually turned his cars around and asked them to help transport people to the hospital. So our last thing we're going to cover is actually what is sometimes called the forgotten catastrophe or the forgotten calamity. Um, and it is uh, the flu. 
It is the 1918 flu pandemic. I'm sure most of you have probably heard of it. Sometimes it's referred to as the Spanish flu. Um, and so the question really becomes, you know, how deadly was it? And so these are just some statistics to give you an idea. Um, an estimated 50 million people died with this flu. Some populations, like the Eskimo population in Alaska, lost 60% of the people there. And just for a reference, this, this flu outbreak killed 2.5% of those people that were infected. The average death rate with, the, with influenza is less than one-tenth of 1%, one okay? So this is extraordinarily high. Um, this flu kind of breaks out in, in two separate phases. Uh, the first phase happens in March and April. And you can see from the graph up on the left, we have a little spike in March and April. Um, in the United States, it pretty much breaks out in March in Kansas on a military base. At Fort Riley, within a week, 500 people are sick in the infirmary. But here's the thing with this first phase, it's pretty typical flu. It's not unusually deadly. It, most people recover within a few days and it follows the pretty typical pattern for a, a flu virus and a flu outbreak. Unfortunately, the flu comes back in the fall and you can see it starting in September, skyrocketing in October and continuing on through November and December. And the map that is on the, uh, the right hand side, if you look at it, those spots that are either vertical lines or the, just the horizontal lines, those are basically the end of September, the last week in September and the beginning of October. That's how fast the second phase of the flu just, it explodes across the country. And it actually explodes across the world. It's far more severe. They believe that that influenza had mutated. It was, uh, it, Many people were infected, the death rate escalated, and another unusual thing about this was who got sick. In that second phase of the flu, a, a di an unusual number of young, healthy adults ended up dying from the flu. So, you know, the, the dotted line is the typical, you know, kind of who is affected most, particularly to the point where it, the in, influenza kills. While with this, that 20 to 30, 35 age group had a huge number of deaths. And it actually, that year, the average life expectancy in the U.S. dropped by 12 years because of this. So, of course, early on, there's blame. And who's to blame? Where did this flu come from? What is going on? Early on, there was a lot of talk that it must be the Germans. Remember, this is still the middle of World War I. We're still in the middle of the war. You know, it must be the Germans. They must be spreading this, and especially because it's hitting young adults, um, that age that would be soldiers. It's, to it's untrue, and in fact, Germany was hit really, really hard. Another part of blame seems to have been some connection. There was some thought, maybe it's related to the battlefields. All these people are dying on the battlefields, and they're not, it's not being cleaned up fast enough, and there's fumes, and maybe it's related to that. Eventually, it comes to be called the Spanish flu. Um, Spain was one of the first countries to be hard hit, but they were not hit any disproportionately harder than other places. Um, it's just they didn't have wartime restrictions as much on the press. And so once it hit Spain, word really started to spread and it exploded. Um, you can also see that a big part of how it was believed to have been spread was by spitting. And so we see lots of laws develop about spitting, no spitting in public, no um, you know, coughing in public, no sneezing in public. Um, in Wisconsin, this is kind of how it plays out. And you can see that for deaths, Sheboygan, had, Sheboygan County had 207. 
which is pretty high compared to most of the area surrounding us. Um, Within the city, there were 2,400 recorded cases. And just between October and December, kind of that height of the outbreak, there were 1,868 new cases reported. And you can see that real spike in the outbreak and the associated deaths in that October time frame. So obviously the, how, the height of the outbreak is in October. And so this is, it kind of plays out really pretty quickly. Um, on October 10th, the Sheboygan Press headline declares the whole state is closed. People are encouraged to stay home, don't go out. If you buy something from a store and you don't want it, don't bother to return it. They're not going to take it back. On the 12th, the city health department, the director, warns that the city is in an epidemic. It's an epidemic outbreak. It's out of control. Two emergency hospitals have to be open. They open a hospital at 99 Hall, and they also open a hospital and a hotel in 14th and Michigan. Within a week, Dr. Reich of the health department orders that homes be placarded and the city council has an emergency meeting because they're in a crisis okay and they're gonna establish some ordinances and things we'll talk about one in just a minute one week later Dr. Reich of the health department says conditions are improving and the end is in sight so within a two-week time frame we go from an epidemic and it's a crisis to ah, things are getting better um, this is an example of one of the placards that was required on homes. So this one is from the city of Milwaukee, but the one uh, we've seen one from Sheboygan, and it looked just the same except it said city of Sheboygan. And you'll notice nobody can come or go from a house if influenza is there that must be posted unless you're a physician, a nurse, or a clergyman. And it can only be removed by the order of somebody from the health department. You can't just take it down yourself. In other prevention, and part of that, those city crisis meetings, they do establish an ordinance in Sheboygan that there will be no expectorating in public places, sidewalks or on public conveyances. The police department is told to enforce it. They're not kidding. <laughs> the health department isn't kidding. We're not just passing this, you know, to pass it. You need to enforce it. And the, if you are caught, it is severe. Five days hard labor or a $5 fine. So here is just a few final statistics uh, to put it in perspective. As much as 207 people died, 600,000 died in the U.S. alone. And you can see the same as here, 200,000, almost 200,000 people in October. Um, that 600,000 is an average of 1,643 people a day for an entire year. And at that point in time, if you were a soldier, if you were involved in World War I, you were far more likely to die of the flu than you were to be killed in combat. And that actually is true of every single war. You were more likely in 1918 to die from influenza than anything any sort of battle that had occurred. And you can see worldwide 30 to 50 million people, 10 million people in India alone. And it's estimated that half of the population ended up with the flu during this, um, during this pandemic. And so as Bill said, that's all for now. And uh, here's our wish that you never experience a calamity of any of those magnitudes. So thank you very much.